Welcome to Woodview Christian Church's online worship. We're really glad that you've joined us today. A um, couple of things as we get started. Down at the bottom of your screen, you'll probably notice there are some links. We'd encourage you to take advantage of those. There's a link there for the worship music for this service. There's a link there for comments. Please let us know that you've joined us. And if you have any special needs, uh, reach out to us through those comments and we'll respond and we'll reach out to you. Uh, there's a link there for giving. And there's also a link there for prayer, if there's a special prayer need you have. Now, as we get started, we're going to have communion, and we're also going to have a time of giving before the message. And we'd encourage you to get prepared for the communion time. That means you need to get a little something to eat and a little something to drink. And we've talked about this. Um, it can be a cracker and water. It can be a cookie and milk. Uh, we don't want to be legalistic about it, but last week I tried a Klondike bar and a latte. That just didn't feel right, but, uh, you know, if that's your thing, that's all right. So just something to remember the body of Christ and the blood of Christ as we celebrate communion. So why don't you take a few moments and go get those things and get settled in. As we prepare for our communion time, um, I just want to read a passage of scripture to you. This is from the Gospel of Mark, the 14th chapter. While they were reclining at the table eating, he said, Truly I tell you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. They were saddened, and one by one they said to him, Surely you don't mean me. It's one of the twelve, he replied one who dips bread into the bowl with me. The Son of Man will go just as it is written about him, but woe to that man who betrays the Son of Man. It would be better for him if he had not been born. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take it, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank from it. This is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many, he said to them. Truly I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Let's go ahead and take communion. Now in our worship time, we come to the time of giving, and it's an opportunity for you to express your love and your appreciation to God. It's also an expression of your complete reliance and dependence on him, knowing that he is faithful to provide your every need. And so there are a number of ways that you can give. You can, of course, uh, write a check or send cash and mail it to the church office. In just a moment, that address will come up on the screen, but it's 3785 Woodview Avenue, uh, Wyoming, Michigan, 4. 
1-800-849-4909. You can go to our website. There's a Give tab at the top. You can use that. You can use the Give Plus app. Uh, you can also text the amount of money that you would like to give to 616-219-0033. And we're still uh, coming into the office on Thursday mornings, and so if Thursday morning you want to drop it off, you can do that. So take a moment and give. One of the books I've read while being quarantined is a book entitled Transformed by Caesar Kalinowski. And in that book, he tells of uh, an elderly gentleman kind of in his neighborhood that he was working at building a relationship with. This man's name was Hal. Hal was a World War II veteran, and uh, he had to walk around with an oxygen tank. He was constantly on oxygen. And Caesar said that one day, Hal's wife, Gail, came over to to uh, Caesar's house and explained to him that she was going to go out of town for three weeks. She'd be going to California to visit her sister for three weeks. And she asked Caesar if he would be willing to look in on Hal and make sure he was okay while she was gone. So Caesar assured her he'd be happy to do that. And on one of his visits to check on Hal, Caesar was knocking on the door for an extended period of time. He saw that Hal's car was out front, so he knew that Hal was home. And eventually... The front door opened, and there was Hal, and Hal wasn't looking any too good. So Caesar said, hi, Hal, I'm just here to check on you, but you don't look like you're doing very well. And Hal said to him, well, come on in. I need to go back upstairs. I need to lie down and put my feet up. He says, my feet are killing me. And Caesar Kalinowski looked down at Hal's feet, and he could see why they were killing him. His feet were, were very, very swollen and red, and uh, they were breaking open. Caesar said it looked like there was motor oil oozing out from them. And uh, so Hal made his way very gingerly up the steps, and Caesar had never been upstairs in their home. He followed him up the steps, and Hal threw himself on the bed with a grunt and uh, tried to lift his feet up. And Caesar said, Hal, tell me, what's going on? Why is this happening? And so Hal told him about the condition that was causing the swollen uh, scaly, cracked feet. And Hal said, you know, usually it's not a problem because when my wife Gail is here, she's able to put ointment on my feet, and that just really, really helps. And he said, it's that ointment over there on the dresser. And so Caesar, uh, Caesar kind of looked at these feet, and he, he looked across the room at the dresser, at this tube of ointment, and he said, you mean uh, that that medicine right there, that ointment right there? And Hell said, yep, that's, that's the magical stuff. But he said, I can't put it on my own feet. I can't bend over to do that. And so all of a sudden, Caesar Kalinowski had a decision to make. And um, he was thinking about uh, what he would do. And he had this decision to make whether he, would, whether he would reach out and he would put this salve or this ointment on Hell's feet. And so there was, a, there was a part of Caesar where the Holy Spirit was screaming into his head saying, come on, Caesar, you know what you need to do. You know what you should do. But there was this other part of Caesar that was screaming just as loud on the opposite side saying, you know, can't we just tell him that we'll pray for his feet? Can't we offer to take him to the doctor and the doctor can put the medicine on his feet? Can't we just leave and hope somebody else shows up to help? But Caesar Kalinowski, you'll be glad to know, went over and grabbed the tube of medication and, and put the ointment on Hal's feet. And he continued to do that for several days until Gail came back from California. Now in that book, as Caesar's describing this, he says that there was a, a definite moment in time where the decision was made that he would help Hal with his feet. And he said that was when he, he thought back to the fact that this expression of kindness to hell would really just simply be a demonstration of the kindness that Jesus had shown to Caesar. 
And he said it especially became real when he realized that Jesus had suffered so much for Caesar, done so much for Caesar, even to the point of having nails pounded through his feet. And so in that book, Caesar says that, that when, we, when we serve and bless and love others, it's really an expression of gratitude for the service, blessings, and love that Jesus has shown us. We are called to be disciples of Christ, and we are commanded to make disciples of Christ. And so we're trying to answer the question, what is a disciple? And today I want to help us see that the Bible says that that disciples of Christ love with crazy love. The word disciple means student or learner, but don't think of learning or being a student as we usually understand it. When we think of learning, we usually think of somebody pouring knowledge into our brain. But the word disciple really meant to, uh, to follow someone in order to become like someone. It was more than just gathering information. It was living with someone and being with someone who is above you or beyond you. And so it meant to follow them, to observe them, to learn from them so that you would become like them. And so as we think about the crazy love of disciples of Jesus, I want to take us to a passage of scripture where Jesus says that his disciples are to love the way Jesus loves. It's a familiar passage. It's John chapter 13, and I'm going to read verses 1 through 5, and then I'm going to skip down to verses 31 through 35. It says, it was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The evening meal was in progress, and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal took off his outer clothing and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. And now I'm skipping down to verses 31 through 35. When he was gone, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man is glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will glorify the Son in himself and will glorify him at once. My children, I will be with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and just as I told the Jews, so I tell you now, where I am going, you cannot come. A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another." By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Disciples love with crazy love. But there is probably not another word in the English language that is as misunderstood as that word love. We use it in so many different ways. We tell our children we love them, and then we say that we love a song playing on the radio. We say that we love God, and then we say that we love pizza. And the writers of the New Testament also struggled with finding a word that would correctly communicate the differences of emotion. And they particularly wanted to find a word that would describe and explain the, the, the incredible love and sacrificial love of a Christ follower, the love that they were experiencing from God and the love that they were called to express by God. And uh, so they, they scoured the Greek language to find this word, but there wasn't a word that would adequately describe the kind of love that Jesus calls us to. And so they, they found this, this word in the Greek vocabulary, agape, a word that was very seldom used and they borrowed that word and they infused it with new meaning. And this is the word that we read throughout our Bibles. This is the word that we read throughout this passage six times in those verses. 
And so what I want to do this morning is I just want to point out to you three characteristics of Christ-like disciple love that we observe in this passage. Then I want to share with you how we can love like that, and then I'll just close in prayer for us. So observation number one is that Christ-like crazy love notices needs others don't. Crazy love notices needs that others don't. There were at least 13 people in the upper room, at least that we know of. There might have been more. Um, There probably were more because, I mean, somebody had to be there to paint the famous picture, right? (laughs) But... But out of all the people, whoever, however many there were in that room, Jesus was the only one who noticed their dusty feet and was willing to do something about it. You see, true disciples have been trained in love to the extent that they constantly have their radar up looking for unmet needs. And they're looking for unmet needs because they know that those represent opportunities to love. That's why I like the way uh, John writes in 1 John chapter 3, verse 17. He says, If anyone has resources and sees his brother or sister in need but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in him? Did you notice how John phrased that? If you see someone in need... If you notice someone in need, if you observe someone in need, do something about it. One of the ways that love leaks is when we fail to observe. If my wife gets a new pair of shoes or she gets a new haircut or she has a a new color of nail polish and I don't notice that, I don't draw attention to it somehow. Love leaks. Because my failure to notice that communicates that I'm, I'm not really paying much attention to her. I'm not really that much about her right now. But if I compliment her on the new pair of shoes or if I make a comment about the new color of, of nail polish, what that says to her is, I'm about you. I notice you. I care about you. I love you. Disciples love with crazy love. So we should notice needs that others don't notice. Um, Until this quarantining thing, our church was quickly moving towards uh, establishing some of what we call community groups. It's just kind of smaller groups of believers who are committed to living on mission. And we were talking about starting some of these community groups maybe in a specific neighborhood or to work with a specific school or uh, maybe at uh, at a retirement home. And part of getting ready for that was we invited our people and encouraged our people to do prayer walks. And we were really going to try and ramp up those prayer walks in late spring. And uh, I don't know, maybe we'll still be able to do that or maybe it'll happen throughout the summer. But what's, what happens on prayer walks is that as you are walking and praying, one of the things you specifically pray for is that God would open your eyes to see the real needs, the real needs in this neighborhood, the real needs in this school, the real needs in this retirement home. Because those needs are ways that we can express and demonstrate the love of Christ. Now, I don't know what those needs might be. It could be that this park in this neighborhood needs to be cleaned up. It could be that this school needs tutors or crossing guards. It could be that this retirement home needs volunteers or needs some painting done or it needs some flowers planted. I don't know. It could be almost anything. But disciples of Jesus... Love with a crazy love that notices needs that others don't notice. Another observation from this passage is that Christ-like crazy love loves in ways that lifts others up. So Jesus notices their dusty feet and it says that he, he gets up from the meal and he takes off his outer clothing and he wraps a towel around his waist and he pours water into a basin of water and he begins to wash the disciples' feet. 
Later on, down in verses 13 and 14, Jesus is explaining to the disciples more specifically what it is that he has done for them. And in those verses, he says, you're right, I, I am your Lord. I am your master. I have authority over you. And yet, he humbled himself and he lifted them up. One evening this past week, I was watching a, a TV program. It was kind of a, a year in the life of the Vatican, showing what, it, what it's like to live and work in the Vatican. And I'm not sure what year it was filmed, but it was pretty recent. And uh, one segment of this, it was showing Maundy Thursday, the Thursday before Easter. And Pope Francis was going to visit a prison just outside the Vatican. Apparently, popes have done this for a number of years, but they go to this prison and on Maundy Thursday, they wash the feet of some of those prisoners. On this particular day, Pope Francis was gonna wash the feet of 12 prisoners. Now, not all of those prisoners were Catholics, and uh, seems pretty obvious, but not all of them were good Catholics. And uh, so uh, there were two of these prisoners who were talking back and forth, and the TV cameras caught it. And one of the prisoners said, now, now who's coming? And the other one said, the Pope. And he said, the, the Pope's coming? And he said, yes. And he says, so the Pope's coming and we're to wash his feet? No, 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 he said. The Pope's coming and he's going to wash our feet. And the other prisoner said, you mean the Pope is coming here and he's going to wash my feet? Yes, said the other prisoner. And it showed it on, on TV as Pope Francis knelt before these 12 prisoners and each of them had a, a shoe off and, and the Pope poured just a little bit of water on the top of their foot and he, he dried it with a towel and then he picked their foot up and he, he kissed the top of their foot. And you should have seen the faces of these prisoners because here they were, prisoners, put away, forgotten. And the Pope, the head of the Catholic Church is there they're noticed, they're loved, they're lifted up. Agape love, Christ-like disciple love, places the other person first. And it'll take the risk of showing love regardless of the other's response. One of our values of our church, we have it up on the back wall in the worship center, one of our values is that we will love others with Christ-like love regardless of how they respond. So the crazy Christ-like love of a disciple says, I will lose some of who I am for you. I will lay down my life. I will give up my right. You are more important to me than I am. The third observation from this passage is that Christ-like crazy love loves everyone equally. The uh, Bible says that you are to love your neighbor as you love yourself, no matter who that neighbor is. The book of 1 Thessalonians says, And may the Lord make your love to grow and overflow to each other and to everyone else, just as our love does toward you. To each other... And to everyone else, that about covers it. We love everybody equally. And Jesus demonstrates that in this passage. He gets up from the meal. He wraps a towel around his waist. He pours water in a basin. And he begins washing the disciples' feet, even the feet of Judas, who would betray him. John writes in chapter 6 of his gospel, many chapters earlier, he says back in chapter 6 that Jesus already knew who it would be that would betray him. And yet Jesus humbles himself and he gets down on his knees in front of Judas and he washes the feet of Judas, knowing that in just a matter of hours, Judas will lead the soldiers to arrest Jesus, the soldiers who will beat Jesus, the soldiers who will lead Jesus to the cross. We talk a lot about love, especially in the church. And sometimes I get concerned that I think a lot of our love is conditional rather than caring. If an expectation or a condition isn't met, then the love is withheld. 
but agape love, crazy love. Disciple love doesn't have conditions. It doesn't have stipulations. It doesn't have expectations in order for the other person to be loved. Chris Carrier was 10 years old when a man became enraged at his father and because this man was so enraged with Chris's father, he abducted Chris. This man took Chris, he burned him with cigarettes, he stabbed him multiple times with an ice pick, he shot Chris in the head and then threw him out like garbage in the Florida Everglades, leaving him to die. Miraculously, Chris survived and was found. The only lingering physical effect from that entire ordeal is that Chris is blind in one eye, but the man, the perpetrator, was never found. He was never discovered or arrested. Chris has grown up. Chris, uh, Chris went to college. He became a youth pastor at a church there in Florida, uh, became a Christian, obviously, got married, started his family, and one day he received a phone call. And the phone call said that there was this 77-year-old blind ex-con living in a nursing home in Miami, Florida, who had confessed to this crime against Chris. And so Chris went to Miami. Now, did Chris go to Miami packing a gun? Did Chris go to Miami looking for revenge? I mean, after all, now... Now the perpetrator was kind of in the same position that Chris had been when all of this had happened. Now he was helpless. Now he was blind. Now he was, he was the one. He could be victimized by Chris if that's what Chris wanted. But Chris didn't go for revenge. Chris went as a disciple. He went to forgive and to love. So Chris began visiting this man by the name of David McAllister. And he continued visiting him. And sometimes they'd read the Bible together and sometimes they would pray together. And through these visits, Chris led David McAllister to Christ. Now, is Chris Carrier just a super Christian? <laughs> is it that, um, that he just lives with Jesus on a whole nother plane so he can love like that? Does he have some kind of special dispensation from God to be able to, to love with that kind of crazy love? No. Not really. So how can, we, how can we notice the things, the needs that others miss? How can we lift others up with love and humble ourselves? How can we, how can we love everybody equally, even those who have wronged us, even those who have hurt us, even those who have done horrible things, maybe even unspeakable things to us. The truth is, you can't. But Christ in you can. Augustine said that our sin nature is like us being curled in on ourselves, turned in on ourselves. But as we've seen over the last couple of weeks, Coming to Christ, being a disciple of Christ, means that, that we not only come to Jesus, but we are changed by Jesus. And we are fully committed to becoming like Jesus. When we come to Christ, something is added to us. We don't just have our sin nature that turns us in on ourselves, but now we have the Spirit of God added to us. Our sin nature blinds us to the needs of others. But the Holy Spirit opens our eyes to those needs. Our sin nature wants us to exalt ourselves and keep other people down. The Spirit of God wants us to lift others up and humble ourselves. Our sin nature wants us to only love those who will show us love in return. But the Spirit of God wants us as disciples of Christ to love everyone, even those who might reject our love, even those who might return abuse for our love. Chris Carrier 
wrote an article for a Christian magazine. And in that article, he said this, While many people can't understand how I could forgive David McAllister, from my point of view, I couldn't not forgive him. If I chose to hate him all these years or spent my life looking for revenge, then I wouldn't be the man I am today, the man my wife and children love, the man God has helped me to be. Each and every day we live, Jesus loves us with crazy love. And he asks us as his disciples to love others with that same crazy love. Because it is only through godly, Christ-like, disciple love that the love of God is witnessed and demonstrated to the world. Let's pray. Father God, Thank you for loving us with crazy love. A kind of crazy love where you sent your one and only unique son, God incarnate, into this world so that if we would put our faith and trust in him and hold on to him without letting go, We would not perish. We would not die. But we would have the life that is true life. We would have the life of having your image in us being reconstructed, remade, made clear again. The obstacles being slowly but persistently removed. So, Father, help us as disciples of Jesus to live in And to treat others with this Christ-like, crazy kind of love. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.